Thank <laughs> you. 
All right, and we are live. Hello, everyone. Uh, if you look at the comments, there's a New York Post article showing firefighters lighting off the fireworks. Mmm, yeah. And we're trying, I bet they pull some shit like, we're just trying to entertain the fans. I mean, entertainment stops at a certain point, especially when uh, people are already kind of fearing for their lives. You know what I hate? What's that? When games don't turn on subtitles. Like just uh, by default? Yeah. Same. Yeah, and Coco like, and I both. Go it. Go Coco and I both, like, yeah, that's a big pet peeve. <laughs> if I pull up options and I look at audio, it should be under audio. Yeah. Not graphic, language, hands, controls, or default, like not. Maybe it's video, under, sometimes, no, but like... Not under graphics, not under audio, it's under language. Language? What? Mm -hmm. I don't even, I don't even follow the logic on that one. I mean... Hmm. What am I gonna do this guy? There's gotta be some. Hold on. Do I just like shoot an egg at him? It's one thing I miss about the first Banjo Kazooie is like you had basically like seven moves and you could just try all of them and figure it out. Whereas with this, there's like a ton of moves and then each character has their own moves when they split up that you gotta all like learn. Although I will say, being able to go around with the Kazooie Glide is really satisfying. So, fun story. Uh -huh. I decided to test uh, my ice pump last night. Yeah. And my teacher. So I and I have like a bunch of year old extracts I've been making of lemon, or no, lemon lime, mm -hmm. orange, mint, and raspberry. Nice. I was like, I'm gonna try mixing it with the orange in the, in the candy. So, the texture is not an orange flavor, but it's, it's still regular flavor. But I decided I'd throw in some orange extract with it. Did you know, if you mix totally legal CBD with orange flavor, mm -hmm. it tastes like sweet tea? Really? Yeah. That... I, I am okay with this. Well, sweet tea usually... Okay, sweet tea is usually a black tea with just a shitload of sugar, right? Uh, southern sweet tea is. Mm. This just tastes like a regular, like, sweet tea. Hmm. Like, this is not the gallon of tea with a pound of sugar. This is more like a cup of tea with a spoonful of sugar. Right. It's like a, uh, uh, and actually most sweet teas that you'll get in grocery stores or at restaurants.
restaurants is Orange Pico, not a black tea. Oh, okay. And so, uh, it tastes just like an Orange Pico. Hmm. And, it, and Maddie tasted a little bit of it was like, that tastes just like tea. Yeah. And we're going to try it with lemon one time and mm. see if we can't get it to taste like, uh, this green tea we buy from the local CBD dispensary. Oh, yeah. That is citron green. When you make this green tea and add a little bit of uh, sola mm -hmm. sweetener, it tastes like fruit loops. Ooh. Or fruity pebbles. Which, by the way, if you didn't know, is uh, lemon flavored. What is? Fruit Loops and Fruity Pebbles. They're all lemon flavored? Yeah. What? Yeah. Oh, it's they... not a sour lemon. It's a fruity, like, just the white take out the citric acid. And that's what it is. Lemon. It's just lemon. Yeah, like a lemon cake. The color confuses you and you don't realize it. I'm trying to think back on the last time I've had either of those. I guess... I can't deny that that's what that is. Now I gotta get some sometime. Yeah. You'll be like, holy shit, that's lemon. Yeah, because it's always like, it's the same like one flavor. It's not like they differentiate for the most part. By color, right. Yeah, it's not like a berry mix. It's lemon. Huh. Weird. Like, get like a lemon cake the same day you do, like with a glazed top or whatever at the bakery. At whatever grocery store you go to. Yep. Taste that and then taste the fruit loops and you're like, holy shit, it's just less sweet lemon cake. Hmm. Weird. Mm. Uh, I figured it out like years ago and whenever I pointed it out to people, they come back later like, why the hell did I not notice this? And it's because you're not expecting it. And it's weird because it goes so well with milk, and you don't expect lemon to go well with milk. That's, yeah. Because what happens if you mix lemon and milk is you make a substitute for buttermilk. Yep. If you go real hard, you can make cottage cheese. If you go crazy and heat the milk until it's just steaming hot, but not boiling. Right. And then add vinegar, you can separate the casein from the uh, milk liquids shit, and shit. try that out and make plastic. Right. You've told me about this. I've written articles about this. And this was more common, like, prior to the discovery of plastics, right? Well, prior to the mass production of plastics. Sure. Um, yeah, buttons used to be made from it because it was easy to kind of dye it and make it look like bone or ivory or pearl or, you know, all kinds of different things. And so... Early huh. plastics were made of milk. Wild. Yeah. All these, I... all these lost arts <clears throat> from the yeah. days before when people had to make all the shit on their own. Shit, shit. Well, Casey would have been more. Uh... Mass-produced, factory-produced, but yeah. Sure. I don't know that people were making too much of that at home because that's a waste of two foods, as uh, far as most people would be concerned. At two that foods time. and a cleaning product. Yeah, yeah. Vinegar makes an excellent cleaner. Oh yeah. And it's so cheap to buy it by the gallon. Oh yeah, I mean it's like a universal cleaner if you get the the uh, concentration right. Or you can just use vinegar and 
Not worry about your house smelling vinegary. Hmm. So, how the fuck? I started playing a game earlier today called Observer. And, oh my god, it is impossible to find a walkthrough for that game. I think I've seen the, uh, the, 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 what do you call it, the, like, poster for that something cover, but, like, I, I don't know anything about it. So, the premise of the game is you are a cop in the future at a time where human, uh, in the 80s. Future 80s from Future now. 80s. Cyberpunk. Well, 2080s. Ah, um, okay. The upcoming 80s. Next 80s. Yeah. And, you know, everybody's got these uh, cybernetic enhancements, implants, they call them, that everybody carries, that everybody uses. And they, you know, had a disease or a technological disease or something like that, well, whatever. From what I can tell, the entire game takes place in this one apartment building while you're investigating a bunch of murders. <laughs> and there's no walkthrough for it. So it's super fucking hard to, like, figure out what you're supposed to be doing. Right. And I wound up glitching the game so okay. that I couldn't progress. And I was just like, you know what? I'm done here. I'm just gonna put this away forever. Like it's a psychological horror. And it's good, like in so far as that goes. I would say my biggest complaint with it would be that the one scary thing in it was a jump scare. And I think I discovered something. I fucking might be wrong, but who knows. I think jump scares aren't actually scary. I think they just trigger our fight or flight responses. And that's why we jump, is we are either getting ready to run or to fight. Right. I don't think it's that we're actually scared, it's that we are, you know, like, heh. We don't know which to do. Right. Because the movie was, or the game wasn't scary, it kinda sucked. Like, it was a good game. It was just like. Eh? Well, yeah. I, I always feel like jump scares can be effective, but it's more um, what. Um, it, it, it's more what the roar, the uh, the jump scare is led up with. Like that anticipation of the jump scare is way, way more entertaining than the actual jump scare itself. Yeah. And the jump scare should only be used as a way to like build and then immediately release tension. I hate when they do the jump scare of like. Oh, it's just the cat, and then immediately follow it by the jump scare of the actual thing. Yeah, it also has to be some... It, it can't always be a fake-out. There are times where they go... They try that far too many times, like... In the fucking, uh, The Boy 2, just the trailer. They have a point where the mom is just, like, trying to scare the kid, and... D they do a whole orchestral string and sting and everything when she's basically just saying boo and it's like how s fucking stupid do you think we are that that's gonna get us I mean people pay to see it so yeah, the boy is so it's just emblematic of how of exactly that type of horror the type that's not even trying because they don't they don't think that you can actually fucking like appreciate anything scary see to me it comes across as just bad writing yeah like it's not it's not uh like horror movies are notoriously cheap to make oh certainly uh and so 
to me it comes across like I have an idea for like a creepy monster for a movie and I, I have a slight like half ass story and uh, I know that I've seen a lot of horror movies so I know it's scary and that's jump scares. Yeah, you know, like it shows a lack of creativity. Yeah. Meanwhile, the best lack of... the best horror stuff is the stuff that is um ah oh, shit. Um, the best horror stuff is the stuff where the creature and everything about them ties directly into the actual themes of the story. Like hell, really anything Clive Barker's done. It like actually even his dumbest stuff like rawhide rawhead. Rawhide Rex, which is a, a bad movie based on a pretty decent graphic novel, and it's like, it's kind of cheesy, but it's also still resonates because it actually is about something. Uh, Fucking yeah. God damn it. Man, like, somebody the other day pointed out, yeah, why Hitchcock movies work so well. Mm -hmm. It's because he builds tension. Yes. And he doesn't very rarely do you see the actual, like, attack on screen. Right. You rarely see the thing, you know, you're, uh, like, for instance, in The Birds, you see, like, one scene of attack. In Psycho, there's, like, the original. There's the shower scene. And I think that's pretty much it, right? Like, uh, effectively, yeah. And the rest is all just, and that's not even the climax of the movie. No, that's like the the uh, first or second act turn. Yeah. So. Which was specifically a fake out because the actress was a very popular actress at the time. So the idea of her dying that early in a movie was like supposed to really throw people of like, holy shit. She's that's why out. I like. That's why I recently decided I was gonna watch like a couple of classic horror movies. Mm hmm. So I watched the original 1950s blob movie with Steve McQueen. Mm. And then I watched the remake from the 80s, which I had never seen. Right. And they pull off a little move in that that is so good, which is they build up the character. You're like, oh, this is Steve McQueen's character. Okay, cool. Here are the movie. He, spoiler, dies like almost immediately once the blob is loose. Yeah. Like, he, he, and I will say this, for a lot of 80s horror movies, the special effects were so much better than anything today. Oh, sure. Well, uh, the 80s blob, like, that's one of my favorite horror movies because it was the first horror movie to genuinely terrify me. Mainly because just the concept of being melted alive is so fucking horrifying to me. But, like, the, that, like, the effects in that were really solid. When they get kind of large, like, um, when the blob gets, like, giant and they start doing some, like, uh, I, I don't think it would have been green screen, but, like, uh, composition stuff. It, it it's a little obvious, but it's still like the the practical effects on a lot of those sequences are really good, and a lot of the like actual gore makeup is so solid. My thing, CG shouldn't be the only thing in a movie. Yeah. Unless it's a CG animated movie like The Incredibles or you know Pixar movie. But if it's live action, there should be props on stage that fucking people can interact with that look real. And if anything, CG should be used to enhance that. Well, I, w uh, I would go to say that CG, um, CG, yeah, should be subtle, but also CG, if you, you should recognize, like, is this CG going to look realistic enough? And if it doesn't, the best movies are the ones that recognize that and lean into the other side of it and make the CG very stylized. So that, like, the Speed Racer movie from 2008. Yeah, it it doesn't really look that good, but, like, it's not trying to look realistic. It's trying to look like a Speed Racer cartoon, and I think it succeeds. Because it, 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 they stylized the hell out of it so that it has its own unique look that, to this day, 
hasn't really aged because it was never trying to look any better than it is. Then you look at something like the Langoliers. Yeah. And that looks like absolute shit. Like, I, I, I challenge anyone to watch the CG in that movie and go, yeah, that was a good decision. Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah, it was made for TV, so it was cheaper, but... I mean, the best examples for me are when you look at um, The Lord of the Rings uh, versus The Hobbit. Because The Lord of the Rings, they did as many practical effects as they could. A lot of forced perspective, a lot of very... <laughs> These are not fake movies, it's my childhood. <laughs> um, but uh, the... The Lord of the Rings, they did as many practical effects as they could, and then only used VFX when they absolutely had to. For, like, the big crowd shots, they would use, like, cloning and stuff, and they would do it in ways that were as hidden as possible so that it didn't stand out. And then, um, the Hobbit, they literally just, just green-screened everything. Yeah, it looked, looked pretty bad. Made, yeah. They made Ian McKellen cry. Which is yeah. just why? Why, guys? Not Can I not say something? Cool. On? Can I say something? What? I can't stand the Lord of the Rings movies. None or of the them. Hobbit. None of them. Really? I have tried. I have tried to watch every single one of them, and I fall asleep within five minutes every time. Mm. Okay. No. The Lord Maddie of the Rings. Took me to see, Maddie took me to the theater to see uh, one of the Hobbit movies, the one with the barrels. Uh, and the waterfall. The second one, I think. Yeah. Sure. And I fell asleep five minutes and she kept having to elbow me because I was snoring. I... You old people are just making up fake movies at this point. Come up, go up, come up, go. I... Says Coco. Yeah, well, that's what I was reacting to. Well, do you remember when uh, we were. You know, you remember uh, the sequel to Army of Darkness, right? The City of Death? No. God damn it, Iggy. Way to go with the joke of making up movies. Oh. F fucking. You remember said... City of Death, don't you? Where he went to the source of the Deadites and fought them in their own light. Actually, that would make a damn good movie, wouldn't it? That wouldn't be too, too terrible. The it was thing... sad that we never got the movie, uh, the, the true sequel that we were going to get. Mm -hmm. and, I mean, we kind of got it, but it wasn't what it was going to be. Well, actually, it was the setup for the true sequel to Army of Darkness. Ooh. Which, the, you would think Army of Darkness was the setup to the sequel of Army of Darkness, but no. It's a completely different movie. If I didn't watch Kill Count, I wouldn't know about Army of Darkness, to be honest. True. Yeah, because it's not called is. Evil Dead. It's a YouTube series where a guy goes through and, like, actually breaks down movies and counts how many deaths. And breaks down the statistics of all of the deaths in horror movies. It's really I fun. discovered Army of Darkness entirely because of a cheap video game. Uh, Evil Dead, A Fistful of Boomstick. That was on like the PS2, right? Yeah, and it was good. Was it? So I got, oh yeah, I want to get a copy of it so, so badly. And I could just never find one. Yeah. Um, that's the problem with being into, like, obscure shit like that. Like, I I really wanted to play, um, the... There was a, game, a spawn game on PS2 that I played a lot, and I, I haven't been able to find, like, a decent ROM of it, or, I guess, ISO for PS2. I can't even find that for... You know, there's a game. So there's two games, actually. So I'm going to look up the Evil Dead one first and see how much that's going for on Amazon. Because mm -hmm. we have a PS2. Um, Maddie's family had one. So Evil Dead PS2. Full of boomstick. And uh, that got me 
into the movies, which got me into his book. Wait, uh, uh, goddamn, uh, Bruce Campbell's book, If Chins Could Kill. <laughs> nice. Uh, two left in stock, order soon. A hundred and nine dollars. Oof. That's rough. The other game, yeah, the other game I loved that, that, that was from the PS2 era that I grew up with was Shadow Hearts. Hmm. In the New World. Or from the New World. That one sounds vaguely familiar. It was kind of Final Fantasy JRPG ish, sort of. Um. For the PS2. And. All I really. I'm like at a point now where I'm so desperate to see this game again that I'm about to look up a goddamn, like, let's play of it. Mmm. Um. So there's a copy for $50 on Amazon still used. Oh, well, I mean, that's less than it would be brand new. <laughs> Yeah, but it's such an obscure title that, like, you're wondering, like, why is it that much? Uh, you go to places like Chicago, the Grand Canyon, Las Vegas, New York, Chichi Itza, uh, like, all these specifically obscure places. Mm -hmm. Um, it's apparently the third in a Shadow Hearts series. Um, the story begins as Johnny Garland, a 16-year-old detective who lost his father, sister, and memory in an accident, accepts an investigation to track down a criminal suspect who has escaped from custody. As he closes in on the suspect, Johnny witnesses a supernatural occurrence. A huge monster appears from a green light known as a window and swallows up the criminal. Apparently, a series of horrific incidents similar to this have been plaguing cities across the nation. Johnny's female counterpart is a 21-year-old bounty hunter, Shania, a Native American who is searching for these mysterious windows, determined to close them using her spiritual power.